You're listening to the Teak Nation Podcast, where we strive to educate, inspire, and entertain you with tips and lessons from frauders and friends of TKE. Hello, Teak Nation Podcast listeners. My name is Alex Swenson, and I am honored to be bringing you this week's episode of the Teak Nation Podcast. Very exciting interview that we set up for this week with the venerable Grand Preetness, Frater Ted Bearswell. We will get into Ted's laundry list of accomplishments, both in Teak and outside of Teak, in the conversation. But it was uh, it was a good good discussion and a, a great opportunity to have someone come and share his decades of knowledge and perspective with you, our listeners. So uh, Donnie and I had an opportunity to talk to Ted last week. Excited to bring that to you now, and we will go to the interview. We are honored now to welcome in the venerable Grand Preetness of Tall Kappa Epsilon, Frater Ted Barriswell from his home in Houston, Texas. Ted, first question, you hosted a little get together for the Grand Council last weekend and some of the staff members. Has the house recovered, and is Kim, your lovely wife, willing to let us back in the front door at any point in the near future? <laughs> yes, it's recovered. I <laughs> must admit, you guys were pretty good. Uh, you were on your best behavior. So uh, there's just a wonderful evening. Uh, I think everybody had a great time. I, I know that we are very happy to host it, and um, you know, look forward to getting together again. That's fine. We'll we'll come back in the summer so we could you know take a little dip in the pool next time. But we'll, that's probably yeah. going to happen, I I guess pre conclave. <laughs> you do you do you want to extend the invite to all of Teak Nation to come yeah, take it all pre pre conclave? All seven hundred uh, conclave attendees. Yeah. Well, probably not. Okay. <laughs> I, just, I, want, I wanted that. to ask I, on behalf of our members. I wanted to get that out there. I don't think my wife would like it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I want to start, Ted, and we'll get into your your life and, and career and everything. I want to start though in 2013 because you, I think, like a, a a lot of members, had a really good teak experience in college. Stepped away from the fraternity for a little bit, and then had an opportunity to get reengaged. You get a phone call that says. Ted, would you like to serve on the Grand Council of Tall Kappa Epsilon, which you probably weren't expecting at that time, I would imagine. Take us back to that moment, right? What's going through your head? Why did you accept that invitation, number one? And then number two, not only did you accept that information, you have committed the past eight years of your life to being on the Grand Council and now serving as Grand Preetness. Why did you continue to stay engaged ultimately to the point where, where, you're, where you're at right now? Yeah, thanks, Alex. I mean, um, like many teeks, you know, upon graduation, you you tend to go away. I mean, I, I was guilty of that. Uh, um, I graduated in 1980, so I was gone a lot of years. And, uh, you know, I focused on getting married, raising a family, uh, focused on my career. And then by, as you said, by 2013, I find myself married for 29 years uh, with two grown children. I'd retired from my job, uh, still active on several boards, did consulting, angel investing in software companies. I mean, I, I was pretty darn busy, frankly, um, but uh, had you know, been away from Teak. Well, it was uh, at that time that my best friend from college, a fellow Teak at the University of Texas, uh, Gamma Upsilon chapter, uh, his name was Brian Montgomery. Brian was serving on the Grand Council. Uh, he approached me. Um, he had gotten to the council from his friend, Ed Moy, who was the, uh, I believe he was the Venerable Grand Preetness at the time. And uh, Ed had encouraged Brian to get involved. And then Brian had encouraged me to get involved. And so I attended a meeting in Houston. And uh, actually, the Grand Council was having a meeting in Houston. And I, and I was asked to uh, join them for dinner, which I did. And, um, you know, found out a lot about the fraternity. And I, you know, as a collegiate in Austin, um, didn't know a whole lot about what happened at national, as it was called, and and uh, so they, you know they kind of clued me in. I got to know what happened, and and I just thought that you know for a fraternity that had done so much for me and was you know really part of my life and the formation of you know a lot of my background, what I do, how I approach things. I mean, because of all that, uh, I decided okay, um, I I think I will join the Grand Council. Well, uh, you know, you have to be asked. In, in that case, I was asked to be an at-large member. And um, I said, yeah, by all means. And uh, that, so that's how it happened. 
And uh, I've continued to serve because I love a challenge and there's always challenges to be met, you know, and, and I'm all about continuing our commitment to excellence and to the continued success of Tall Kappa Epsilon. So BGP in that re-engagement in 2013 until now, over the last nine years, what are some relationships or experiences, things you, you know, we haven't gotten in yet into your personal story, but you've traveled all over the world. You've had an incredibly successful career. What are some unique experiences, relationships, things that you never expected that have occurred over the last nine years in working with the council and uh, relationships that you form with volunteers, professional staff, just folks throughout Teak Nation? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, you know, in my career, my career was almost all in enterprise software and it was always in sales. And so you basically were around a lot of people that had like interest, right? And um, and you, you didn't meet a lot of people uh, that, you know, had different interests, had different career pursuits, whatever. You kind of get in your own, you know, little world there. And yeah, I think that's the case with many jobs. And so, um, you know, kind of the unexpected things were, I've met at least a dozen people on the Grand Council and the professional staff that I would never have met before. And, um, you know, in addition to being frauders, uh, they've all become friends, you know, in many cases, close friends. And if you think about it, most people serve on the Grand Council for 10 years or more. And uh, so you forge deep and, and uh, lasting relationships with people and those relationships tend to last many years beyond your service. So that was really a neat experience. Um, and then just meeting the collegiates, interfacing with them at regional leadership conferences, at Conclave. I mean, you know, it's like, I, I love to talk to them. I love to, to give them advice if they want it, you know, to mentor, all those things. I mean, when you, you know, when you're in a job like I was in, basically a sales manager, a sales executive, and and so you're really responsible for mentoring those employees, right? M more than in, in a lot of positions. And um, so that's something that I, I do and, and I like to do. And uh, I realize I'm quite a bit older than the collegiates. And in many cases, I'm probably older than your, your, your uh, parents. But, um, you know, I, I think that the, the people that really reach out and really want advice, really want mentoring, they, you know, they can get it and, and they appreciate it. And, you know, I've also learned how the fraternity operates behind the scenes. I mean, and I have a real appreciation for the work that you do, Donnie, as the CEO, and that the professional staff like Alex do uh, on educational programming, managing risk, communicating with Teak Nation. I mean, it's a really big job. And, and as I mentioned previously, as a collegiate, I really had no idea what went on, you know, up there in, in Indianapolis. But uh, I can assure Teak Nation that a lot of really good work goes on. Frater Ted, you're, you're three, four months in now to your term as Venerable Grand Preetness. Does anything stand out from these last three to four months specifically in terms of good experiences? You know, I, I know that there's a significant mindset shift that takes place when you come into that office, and I know it's a, a role you do not take lightly, but when you think about how that transition has gone and, and you've now had an opportunity to lead two grand council meetings as the, the grand preetness, do any really positive experiences or moments stand out to you as the BGP? Well, you know, I always like to lead organizations. I, I like to be, you know, to earn the honor of being asked to lead organizations. And I really enjoyed my eight years on the grand council and you know, moving up through the ranks and having the different positions, serving in all the different committees and things. But, you know, I, I always knew in the back of my mind that um, I would like to, to take the helm and lead. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's been fun for me. And then, um, you know, meeting with collegiates at events, answering questions about the future direction of Teak. I mean, there haven't been any RLCs or conclaves in my first three months, but there have been some events that I've gone to uh, like, for instance, the University of Houston EO chapter celebrated their 50 year anniversary recently and just seeing the incredible energy and brotherhood in that room, you know, when I spoke to them was really, it was wild. I mean, that it, it was almost too much. Everybody was so happy to see each other. Everybody was talking and, and, um, but, you know, it didn't bother me, but uh, it basically, those kind of things are so great. Um, and, and actually at that event, there was four grand council members and a number of Teak Foundation members who were in Houston for that meeting. 
And uh, so it was really great. I mean, it was really fun to do that. And you you know right away when you know you're announced on stage as as the the BGP, and you know everybody's you know waiting to hear what you have to say. It kind of you know you understand that it's a responsibility not to be taken lightly, and you better do a good job with it. And you know, just another couple things. I've actually in the last few months been asked to write a couple of letters, you know, to frauders who are ill. I, I've had you know, guys reach out to me and say, hey, my friend has got some pretty bad cancer right now. And, you know, would you write him a letter from the Venerable Grand Preakness? And I'm, of course, honored to do that. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not altogether sure why that would help out. But, you know, th this person was, uh, loves the fraternity and, and he thought it would be a really good thing. And well, the, you know, it, I did it. And then I come to find out that the, tum the tumor's almost completely gone. And, um, you know, he is, he's improving. So just wonderful news. I'm not, I'm not claiming I had anything to do with that, but, um, you know, th th those types of things are, um, you know, are, are really nice to do and, I, and I'm happy to do them. Ted, you mentioned some of the interactions that you've had with collegiate members and alumni members, especially, I know, an area that you have a lot of passion is around mentoring and giving professional advice for, for our collegiate members. What are the things when you have those conversations? What do you what do you hope the takeaways are, or are there any expectations? Is it simply you you give the advice and then you know allow those folks to to take with it what they will? Uh, do you have you're someone who's very focused on goals? Do you have any goals when you go and interact with some of our collegiate members at RLC or Conclave? Well, what I hope they take away is you know that they know that I am honored to serve as their grand greatness, um, that they can trust me to do the right thing uphold our principles uh, by example. And I would hope that they would leave that conversation having a feeling of confidence in the entire leadership of the fraternity and, and in its future success. One of the things that I know you're very, very passionate about is, is career advancement, career growth, helping members, right? Find jobs, find internships, hone in their resume, their interviewing skills. And some of my favorite stories that, that you tell about your interactions with our members come from those mock interviews or those networking sessions that we do with the RLCs and Conclave. Why is that an area that you have such a, a passion for and that you choose to promote so strongly and, and heavily, not just as Grand Preakness, but from the moment you stepped onto the Grand Council, I know that's something you've really been promoting and, and you've been a driving factor in how we've changed some of the programming of the fraternity to reflect that. Why is that something you you are very very passionate and feel strongly about? Well, you know, it, it's a cruel world out there. Um, you know, when you're in college, you're in your fraternity. You know, you're surrounded by your brothers. You you know, you're you're around like people and you know similar interests. And it, it's like it, it's a nice world. I mean, people say you know, enjoy your life in college. They'll be the best years of your life. Well, you know, they are really good years. I mean, some might argue that the best years of your life might be meeting your spouse or having children or whatever. I mean, everyone's got things that are important to them. But, you know, when you're in college, you you probably have some fear, some trepidation about the future. I mean, you know, you need to get a job and, and all that. And um, the reason I, folk, I wanted to move the focus more to career advancement to preparation is, um, you need to think about those things. And, you know, every young man needs a mentor in their life. I, I'm just totally sold on that. And that, that mentor could be your, your mother or your father. It, it could be a, a neighbor, uh, maybe one of your dad's friends that's working in an industry that you're interested in, business, medical, law, entrepreneurship. I mean, whatever it is, um, I would encourage you, if you're in college, if you're a, you know, a young alumni, you'll find that mentor. I, I had a couple that I was fortunate to have found and um, you, you really need to, to talk to people that um, can help you and, and any help that we can give as a fraternity uh, like that is good. We're again, looking at some kind of a mentoring system that we wanna put in place. It's just, it's hard to do for a large organization like ours, but it's easier to do potentially on a regional basis or something like that. But um, you know, as some real life examples, I've met with a dozen or so collegiates over the last few years. I've actually helped three of them get jobs at my old company, and I've helped others, uh, like meeting for breakfast or whatever, just kind of giving them the lay of the land. I mean, it's it's like it's not something that you're going to hear in school necessarily. I mean, it, school is great, but it doesn't prepare you for the real world, right? Um, so I, I think those things are something that Petri, you know, can do a good job with. It's something that I really enjoy doing myself.
let's tie a little bit into you've you've mentioned your previous career, uh, someone who elevated to the highest levels at, at Oracle, uh, head of North American Sales. I know. Uh, I think it was Xerox. You had a, a started your career there uh, in selling, and but at Oracle you really took off. And being head of North American Sales, you can talk through how many people that you had to manage simultaneously, which I think alone is a, a very ar arduous task. Uh, but you worked directly for Larry Ellison, who, at least in the conversations you and I have had, I, I think it's fair to say he's an eccentric individual uh, and someone that had a very, very high expectation of excellence, which is you know the theme we continue to live under uh, now under your leadership. Can you talk a little bit about that that path and how you worked from graduating college, starting right away at Xerox and selling, you know, printers and copiers and how, you know, that moved into uh, head of North American sales. And, and what did you learn in such a high pressure, high intense environment where you had to come, you had to bring it every single day and, and every, and day after day after day, if you wanted to continue to be employed. And obviously there's a lot of riches or a lot of um, compensation that came because of that performance, but there's no doubt that pressure was unrelenting. Yeah. You know, many jobs have pressure, and sometimes it's the pressure you put on yourself. But uh, it, at Oracle, it was the pressure they put upon us. Um, you know, you, you're you're in sales; you're always chasing a quota and all that. And um, you know, as you mentioned, I started right out of college. I, I graduated on Saturday, and then Monday morning, uh, I hit the bricks, if you will. I was out making cold calls uh, for Xerox, and back then, that was 1980, and so that's when copiers were still pretty expensive and you actually sold them, you know, going out in the field and all that. And we had even, you know, at that time, we even had machines that would cost a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, the big machines you'd see like at Kinko's or something like that. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I got right out of college and, you know, like I was saying earlier, college doesn't necessarily prepare you for everything that happens in business or the real world or in, in any profession. Um, but I, you know, I just went out there and started making 60 cold calls a day because I didn't know any better, um, going door to door and, and, and really learning as I went. And, um, and so that was, that was very successful. I, I rose to be number one out of 85 reps. And that was my goal, um, in the first year, second year, same thing, you know, number one again. And, and I did that with hard work, with passion. And because I set those goals and, and then I became a sales manager. And so the thing is, it, what's, what's great about Teak was I was the hegemon at my chapter and I had uh, 18 pledges in my class. And so I had to manage them. I mean, I kind of learned how to be a sales manager at Teak and, um, you know, managing 18 young guys, uh, uh, that's pretty hard to do. And so and it's funny, at, at an RLC years ago, I, I held up a, a cardboard poster that I took a... Uh, you know, a marker on it. And I made when I was Hegemon and I just made a big grid and they had all the names on one side and then all the stuff that they had to do on the other side. And, and I told the, the young people at that RLC, uh, Hey, by the way, this is Excel for me. Uh, in 1980, this was an Excel spreadsheet, a piece of cardboard. So, um, but you know, you kind of, you learn skills in the fraternity that can help you in your life. I mean, I, I and I didn't really even realize it until later in life that uh, that stuff happened. But, um, but you know, I, I ended up after a few jobs, I went to Oracle. I, I started as a geographic sales rep, you know, just working a small territory in Houston. And as you said, I rose to become the senior vice president of North American sales, which is a multi-billion dollar a year business with thousands of employees. Um, and so what's really cool about it is you know, I got to have every sales job that you can have almost in, at Oracle uh, working my way up. So I kind of knew uh, what the reps were up against. I knew what the managers were up against. I mean, I think I had around 55 managers, you know, working for me. And, you know, I just, I really had four direct reports that were really great people that uh, did a great job. And, but, um, but yeah, just the, the thing is, about that, about any career is um, you need to find a career, you know, you need to find a job that you like, right? The, it probably won't happen the first job you take uh, out of college. A lot of people, they don't find the right thing, you know, right away. I mean, with, with Xerox, I, I loved it because back in 1980, you know, if you got to work for Xerox or IBM, 
uh, that was like working for Google or Facebook or something today. I mean, I, you know, you still had dinosaurs and stuff around. I mean, you, 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 there was no PCs, no laptops, no cell phones, you know, no Microsoft. Uh, and, and so, but, but basically Xerox and IBM were, were the big dogs and, and I interviewed with both of those. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really very fortunate to have gotten the job with Xerox and, and then to ultimately get to where I wanted to go. So, I mean, I didn't envision myself as, you know, being a copier sales rep for the rest of my life, but uh, I got into software and, um, and I liked that a great deal. And so, you know, your first job may not always be the job that, you keep or you take or that you even want to do but just remember you know be true to yourself find your niche and and also remember nothing is easy <laughs> no one owes you anything success takes hard work and perseverance there are no excuses i mean you and only you are responsible for your future and and if you wake up in the morning with that attitude um you'll, you'll go far you you mentioned that you had goals when you were zero actually you had goals when you're with oracle goal setting is another piece that you 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 talk about every chance you get uh, and and you have led a lot of really great rlc sessions standing room only on on setting goals and um when you talk to our members one-on-one -on -one and, and even leading the grand council i know you're you're focused on goals why is that so important to you why you know why have you found that to be such a vital part of your life and your career and why do you continue to help others learn how to set those attainable but but challenging goals yeah i mean goals are for everybody i mean obviously you know my background in sales is you've always got a goal it's commonly known as your quota or something right i mean it, you, you i just lived my entire life um you know having to set goals because you know, a goal was set for you. And if you didn't make that goal, chances are pretty good that you would be out of a job. So, uh, but, but goals are for everybody. It's, it's kind of like what I say is a person needs goals. You know, without them, you have no ro roadmap. You have no direction of where you're going. You have no way to measure your progress. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And, and goal setting is truly a lost art. I mean, and so, um, yeah, I have conducted some RLC sessions. I may do that again this year. Not, I haven't decided quite yet what I'm going to do, but, but I, I think it's, it's very important. And if you look at the statistics, I'll try to remember them now, but I think what they, you know, they, a lot of people study this and, and around 15% of people set goals. That means 85% don't. And by setting goals, I don't mean, oh, I got to pick up my dry cleaning today, you know, or I need to get gas. But, you know, it, it's not like that. It, it's short term and long term goals. And, and you know, what the definition of short term or long term is, is one that you need to make for yourself. Um, but so in my case, kind of short term, you know, career wise was kind of 90 days. Long term was a year. And I say a year because, you know, in these organizations I'm in, these big monolithic monolithic organizations, they would completely reorg the whole place every year. So, so my long-term goals were around the expectations that I, I needed to make for a year. Maybe for you, they're three years, but, but I would say if you're a collegiate or a young alumni listening to this, it's not three years. It, it, it needs to be, well, the short-term goals may need to be 30 or 60 days. The long-term goals can be, you know, five years, 10 years, you know, 20 years even, but, but really the goals you need to focus on are your short-term ones and occasionally check in on the long-term ones. But, you know, of the 15% of people that set goals, only 2% of the 15% write them down. And even fewer share them with their friends, their spouse, or their boss. And so what that means is nobody knows what your goals are. So guess what? You can cheat. You know, if no one knows what your goals are, then only, and only you know, then, you know, who's going to keep you in line? Right. So I used to tell my managers, I would have them set goals and give me a 30, 60, 90 day plan all the time. We had quarterly ops reviews where they had to go through a lot of stuff. But I, I had a separate exercise where they set goals. And I said, uh, here's the deal. You need to you know, give those goals to your boss. Right. And then the pressure's on. Then you have to really focus on those. And, and if they really are goals that you want to make, then, of course, you want people to be able to, you know, manage you to those goals. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an important part of life and it's, it's not even business. I mean, it could be goals for your family, goals for your kids. Uh, just people just, they're so busy 
and everyone blames it on that. And, and now everybody can kind of blame it on COVID. I mean, you know, it's like, it's easy to do. And, and, and obviously these are major challenges that we face, but, but rise above it and get serious about setting goals. I have had several people tell me that I went to your goal session at an RLC three years ago, and it really changed my life. It changed the way I do things. It helped me be more successful. Uh, I, I can't believe I didn't set goals. So, um, and so as you can see, I have passion around it. I, I think it's it's a smart thing for people to do. Well, that's where I was getting ready to go. You can you can tell the passion that Ted has, not just for goals, but for the organization, for our membership, driving people to their potential. I'm curious, as you serve as Grand Preetness, there's there's always the thought process about when your term concludes, how you want to leave the organization. Do you have any goals or thoughts around that as you you know, whenever it is that you transition off as, as Grand Preetness and the, the legacy that you want to leave and the impact that you hope you were able to, to make on the fraternity? Well, you know, pretty you know, simply, um, I would like to leave it stronger, more efficient, more diverse, and better able to serve our collegiates and our alumni. I mean, that's, that's the best thing that I could possibly do. And I'm hoping that I can do that, you know, via you know, making our meetings more efficient by setting goals, um, you know, by, by doing all the things, by, by working with our foundation and our other peer organizations to, uh, you know, to be more cooperative. Uh, just all these things are really important. And um, so it would be my hope that we'll be stronger and, you know, we'll, we'll move on to bigger and better things. The, the last question that, that I have for you, Ted, is, is in regards to your personal drive. You have accomplished a great deal professionally. You've accomplished now about everything that one could accomplish as a member of the fraternity. What continues to, to drive you? What continues to push you forward? I know you're not one to, to take the foot off the gas and step back and enjoy the fruits of your labor. You are always looking at the next thing, always looking at the next opportunity and the next goal, as, as you've talked about. What continues to push you forward and, and what do you think is going to continue to do that in the future? I actually, I retired from my job at Oracle almost 10 years ago. In July, it'll be 10 years. And um, and I was all, I was told by many people that you don't realize how fast you were running, how crazy that treadmill was until you get out. And and I did. And I and other people told me, make sure that you have some things lined up uh, in your retirement to stay busy. And um, I mean, I, I left and I felt that immediately. It's like, you know, you wake up in the morning and oh, wait a minute, no one's yelling and screaming at me. You know, no one's threatening to hire me, to fire me. So, um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I did a number of things that are stupid, um, you know, like doing day trading and stuff like that, where, you, you know, you think you're a genius. And, but basically, um, I think just being successful and achieving goals is important to me, but the big thing for me was helping others through service and giving back. And so, I mean, a number of us would talk in meetings, you know, at work about how, well, you know, we, we've been blessed and we've had this great ride. And, you know, when I retire, I'm not just going to play golf. I'm going to give back to the community. And, you know, frankly, most people just don't do it. Um, you know, it's human nature, I guess. But um, I really wanted to give back. And, um, and Donnie, you know that I walked the walk with that. Uh, I, I've been on numerous nonprofit boards, you know, like the Grand Council, right? I've spent, I've spent over eight years on that now. I mean, uh, another board in my community where I could really make a difference is the uh, Star of Hope Mission Board. So at Star of Hope is, we kind of trade places. We're often the, the largest homeless mission in the United States. You know, we're always in the top three. Um, and so we, we have a lot of people that we're responsible for. And, you know, homelessness is a huge problem in this country. And, um, and so, you know, we, we have programs that last is, you know, six months, eight months, we, we get people off of drugs and alcohol, we, we uh, get them into classrooms. I mean, in our, in our women, women and children's shelter, we have women that are in classes eight hours a day learning computer skills, learning childbearing, child, child rearing rather. Um, you know, we educate children up to, to kindergarten. We're not licensed to, to do kindergarten on, but we have pre-K programs. Uh, we built a $64 million facility in Houston for women and children. We also take care of men. They're in a separate facility downtown. So, I mean, we, 
I mean, these things, I've been on that board for nine years and I've helped with development, you know, raising funds and I've helped with, with a lot of other things as well. And, um, you know, you really, most of us don't realize what we've got, <laughs> you know, what, how much we have and, and how fortunate we are. And when, when you get into the homeless community, you realize very quickly uh, that there's a lot of work to be done. And it's, it's people like us, like all of us, you know, leaders that, uh, are educated. I want to be a part of something that can help these men, women, and children. And so I'm very passionate about doing that. And I will continue to do that stuff. Um, you know, I was a volunteer advance person for three presidents of the United States. Uh, you know, that, that's a, a job that my friend Brian was doing full time, um, uh, who I mentioned earlier, Brian Montgomery from my fraternity brother. And uh, he's worked, you know, in, in the West Wing for several administrations. And so he got me involved doing advance, which is basically you kind of do everything for the president. You know, when he gets out of the limo, gets off the plane, you're kind of the personal aide for the day, for the event. And, you know, it's a very interesting job. And I did all that as a volunteer. And so and my wife would tell me, well, it's, you know, I guess it's nice that you're working 70 hours a week at Oracle and earning money for uh, all of us. But uh, now you're doing all this other stuff. Uh, you're volunteering like a, a a madman here and uh you know she she didn't always understand it but she you know she embraced it and so you, you just you have to stay busy but you know i got to know the 41st president fairly well george herbert walker bush and um what he was totally into volunteerism into helping people uh he came up with a thousand points of light you know mission that still goes on today his son neil runs it here in houston and um you know what he said numerous times is a life without service to others is not a full life. Okay. So, you know, you know, you know, raising $10 million for St. Jude, right? I mean, the, the stuff you guys are already involved in this stuff. You may not know it, but you are. And so, you know, those kind of things continue to drive me. And, um, and I know that I'll continue to, to do those in the future. One last question that I have VGP people love, People love to hear stories, and if if you do the, if you back chronologically and do the math, you came up uh, at Oracle during really the you know the highest points of the internet age, right in the '90s and 2000s, and in that you got to run in some pretty elite circles. You got to travel the world, uh, all sorts of. You've told me some stories of speaking in front of five thousand, eight thousand people at times. Is there a story or two you just talked about some presidents that you've personally got to know and meet? Is there any unique people that stand out as you've traveled the world or experiences a certain spot in the world uh, that really have been impactful to you? I, I know that uh, our members enjoy hearing stories like that and where your your life's journey has taken you. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of stories. I reiterate that I am honored and I'm, I'm fortunate to have had that opportunity. I mean, you you're given the opportunity, then it's up to you to make the most of it, of course, but I really feel blessed that I had the opportunity. And, you know, when I started, uh, I was got the job in December of 79. And at the time, Oracle had, you know, around 1500 employees worldwide, you know, maybe a few more than that. And then when I left, uh, almost 10 years ago, we had 150,000, <laughs> you know, and it's just going through that process and having the company acquire so many comp different companies and having to integrate those and meet all the people. And, um, you know, th that stuff is, was very challenging, but very rewarding. I mean, I, you know, to be in a room with these people, you know, that, that would come and speak to us at our big open world conference or, you know, you know, people, like from Intel or Apple or, uh, you know, Larry Ellison, these people that change the world, right? You, and you, you get in a meeting with them and you, you feel kind of dumb all of a sudden. You know? I mean, th these are brilliant visionaries. And, um, and it, it, I have a lot of respect for them and what they've accomplished. And, you know, a lot of them get a lot of flack these days for various things, um, like being worth hundreds of billions of dollars or whatever. But at the end of the day, um, those people th that didn't fall on their doorstep. I mean, they, they created that. And so, but you know, it just, you know, from a story standpoint, it's, it's really just, it's just so many things. Um, just, you know, being able to, to be involved and, and to be around these kind of people and um, you know, the standards are very high. The expectations are very high. 
And, you know, you just really get ginned up in the morning, you know, you get out of bed and you know that you're, you know, you're on stage and, and, you know, I did have to speak often in front of, you know, thousands of people and, you know, give, uh, you know, interviews to the press and things like that. I mean, you, you, you do all these things that you probably haven't done before. <laughs> and, uh, but once you, you do them, you, you gain that confidence and, so yeah, it's just it was a it was a very fun ride, and frankly, I'm glad I'm off of that roller coaster and and on to helping other people. Well, brother Ted, we we can't thank you enough for your time. Um, any final closing thoughts, messages that you want to share with the Teak Nation podcast? Just you know, make the most of your fraternity experience. Um, you know, engage, uh, give your time and your treasure when you can. Uh, we need all of you. And uh, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but you know, I'm very impressed with the Grand Council. I'm very impressed with our CEO and our staff and what they're doing for your fraternity. And so I would just ask that you guys all chip in. This, this is a, a great experience that you're having. And um, you know, we need all of you to, to drive it forward and have passion for Tall Cap Epsilon. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's the perfect the perfect ending there. And uh, we will we'll look forward to seeing you at the RLCs. Which which RLCs are you attending? Uh, as of right now, San Francisco and Chicago. All right. So if you want to talk to fraud or Ted Bears while in the flesh, those are your opportunities, uh, as well as obviously Conclave and Leadership Academy, some of those other pieces. But um, just really, really appreciative of, of your time, fraud or Ted, and, and everything that you do for the fraternity. Donnie, did you have anything before? We, we let him go. Just want to thank him for his service. Uh, we've had a number of personal conversations, but uh, he has been someone to step up in a time uh, with Dr. Hickey's uh, personal challenges that he had in terms of his work life and demands and the things that he could not continue to serve. Frater Ted stepped right up uh, to take the mantle and keep us pressing forward as we head towards Conclave. And then the other piece that I will share with our listeners, he's been an amazing mentor to me personally, uh, someone who's become a friend and someone who I can call upon any hour of the day and ask questions. And he's always there to help and give advice and counsel. And I just cannot uh, highlight enough how impactful he's been in my life, but also how impactful he's been in, in driving us as an organization. So thank you, Ted. Thanks, Donnie. All right. We appreciate the appreciate the time. We'll do it again sometime. Hopefully you uh, you enjoyed it, Ted. Hopefully we made this fun for you. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll see you. We'll see you soon. OK, bye bye. And once again, just want to thank Ted for his generosity of time and energy. Um, and again, I hope that there were things that you took out of that where you can hear Ted's passion, A, but B, um, take some some tangible life advice out of there and, and take his words to heart. He's a very, uh, very smart man, very uh, well accomplished and somebody that uh, I know I personally am better for knowing. And if you get the chance to, to get to meet Ted or interact with him in some form or fashion, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, maybe that's at the RLCs here coming up. That is that is the final plug here before we uh, get to our normal closing ode is, uh, is the RLCs. Those are coming up quickly. First one takes place next week in Atlanta. If you have not registered, please do so. If you are an alumnus listening and you want to attend the RLCs, there are special rates available for you specifically to be able to attend if you are part of a chapter who is not registered for the RLCs. Let us know. Let us uh, help you get signed up, get registered, get all the guys in your group that want to attend, get them uh, in Atlanta or San Francisco or Chicago or Jersey City in the month of February. I promise you, you will not regret it. It is an experience that is absolutely worth any registration cost and the value that you will get out of that is something that you can take back to your chapter and make a serious, significant impact. So please sign up for the RLCs if you have not already. And if you have, come find me. I'll be at all four of them. Want to see you there. Want to talk to you. Want to hear from you. Have an opportunity to uh, to interact with the listeners of the Teak Nation podcast. Always, always a fun time. With that in mind, we're going to close it down for this specific episode. Please make sure that you have by this point, smash the like button, hit subscribe, like, shared, told all your friends that you listen to the Teak Nation podcast so that they can think more highly of you uh, and just ensure that you are doing whatever it is you need to do to, to ensure that you are the first person to know when a new episode of the Teak Nation podcast is available. Thank you all. 
Hope to see you soon. Goodbye.